Hello, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us again this uh, hot evening, and which we think it's going to become hotter and hotter after the discussion. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I just wanted to ask before we start, if you don't mind to put your masks, I will also put uh, mine once uh, I stop speaking. Uh, it's much better since we are in a, in a place like that. Um, this is the public program of the Summer Academy called the, for the newcomers called this year the Fortress of Cross Destinies. And this is a continuum. We are already in the crossing number 10, the Empress, where uh, Jennifer Higgy will be speaking about uh, her new book. And I urge you before I introduce Jennifer um, to if you haven't seen previous talks, as it is conceived as a continuum with um, different accounts and multiple responses, um, fortifying, let's say, the freedom of speech, democracy, justice, and not a kind of a monopower um, empire, as usually fortress do, to go online and visit uh, previous talks if you want, also to follow us with the upcoming talks the next um, days. So um, we are very um, honored and happy to have uh, Jennifer Higgy, which is an Australian writer who lives in London. Her book, uh, The Mirror and the Palette, 500 Years of Women's Self-Portrait, is published uh, by, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this very nice, Weindetfeld and Nicholson and, Pig and Pegasus Books in the United States. She's currently working on a new book about women and the spirit world. And she had the BBC uh, Radio 3, a five-part essay that she uh, presented a little bit of this subject last January uh, in 2022. And I think you're gonna read part yeah, of maybe. this book, yeah. maybe. <laughs> Jennifer was um, Freeze Magazine Reviews Editor from 1998 to 2003 co-editor with York Heiser and then Dan Fox in Freeze until 2017, and then editorial director from 2017 to 2019. So she's been with Freeze magazine that most of you know since 1998. And yeah, um, so she's responsible for whatever you've been reading, reading <laughs> all these years. She's the presenter of Bow Down, a podcast about women in art history author and illustrator of the children's book, There Is Not One, editor of the Artist Joke book, and author of the novel Bedlam, and writer of the feature film, I Really Hate My Job. <laughs> In 2017, she curated the Hayward Turing and Arts Council collection exhibition, One Day Something Happens, pictures of people which traveled from 2015 to 2017, and I would not be mentioning all the museums. Uh, she has been a judge for the John Moore Painting Prize and, and Paul Hamlin Award, the Turner Prize and the 2021 uh, Freelance Painting Prize, and a member of the advisory boards of Arts Council, Council in England, the British Council Venice Biennial Commission, and the Contemporary Art Society. She is currently the Imperial World Museum Art Commission. You are part of the Art Commissioning Committee, the Imperial World Museum. Oh, yeah. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So um, today uh, she will be presenting us um, the, the, the book that uh, circulated on 2021. Yes, came out last year. Came out last and in year. And paperback this year. And in paperback this year, which focuses on the history of female self-portraiture from the 16th century until 1980. So I just repeat, it's not just women painters or landscape painters or portraiture is women self-portraiture. Exploring a cross-section of artists from Europe, the US, India, Australia, and New Zealand, the book is a testament to the fact that there is more than, this is quoting uh, Jennifer, more than one way of um, living life, of doing art, free quoting, of looking at yourself or looking at your world. And, um, I leave it here to you, uh, to the woman of the hour, with no further ado. Uh, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, thank you also so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank Marina very much for inviting me to talk tonight. I really appreciate it. And also, it's Marina's birthday today. So, happy birthday! <laughs> older too. <laughs> and plus we forgot that Jennifer Higgy is, is teaching a class, uh, a yes. writing class. Yes, uh, I am. And so um, my writing class has full permission to fully critique what I'm about to say right now. You can say whatever you want. No one else. Um, and I'd also like to say to Flucker, it's so beautiful to be here amid her incredible installation. And I just think this makes me so happy to see this image from 1548 amidst this extraordinary installation. So thank you. I'm really enjoying sitting up here. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. So um, before, I've got lots of images to show you. And if I get through them, I'll show you some images from my new book as well, which are really exciting me at the moment. Um, so I thought if I'm talking about my book, I should read from my book because, you know, it's a book. Um, so I thought I would start with the prologue and then also read um, something a little bit further down the line, which sort of explains some of my rationale. And uh, meanwhile, Katharina van Hemmersen, who painted this at the age of 20 in 1548, can watch over us. And by the way, just while I'm speaking, you might want to think about the fact that this painting is the earliest known painting of a self-portrait of an artist at work, either a man or a woman or anyone else identifying. And, pardon? Uh, this is in Basel, yeah. And there's actually, she also did a copy, which is in um, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Um, but I'll be talking about that in uh, a little while. So my prologue to the mirror and the palette. I started actually with a, a quote from a really extraordinary book uh, by a woman called Christine de Pizan, who is possibly one of the first um, women to make a living from writing. And she wrote this in 1405. So it's actually older than the fortress, which is an amazing thought. Anyone who wanted could cite plentiful examples of exceptional women in the world today. It's simply a matter of looking for them. So plus ça change. She looks at herself again and again. She's in London or Paris or Helsinki or Sydney. She's in a village by the sea or a hamlet in the mountains in a room, a studio, a flat, a place, however small she can call her own. She's a mother, she's childless, she's straight, she's queer, in a relationship or relationships, happily celibate or filled with a longing for something or someone just out of reach. She finally found some time alone, perhaps even a moment of peace, even though there's a clamor in the streets. Modernity is hurtling towards her. She's in competition with history, which has always been dismissive of her power. Until very recently, museums wouldn't buy her work, art historians wouldn't acknowledge her, and commercial galleries would only rarely represent her. She's a miracle, a marvel, a mystic, a seductress, a changeling, a visionary, a man-hater, a freak. She's never considered normal. She knows that no two women are the same. She knows that she has always been here, there and everywhere, but for reasons that baffle her, people still refuse to see her. Even now, decades or centuries after she has died, her magnificent achievements remain largely unsung. There are still countless museums, galleries and collectors who do not appreciate her worth, who do not rate her, who are not interested in the many stories she has to tell. She still has so far to travel. For centuries, she couldn't enter the academy, even though she and her sisters never stopped pounding on its doors. Nor was she allowed to paint anyone naked, not even herself. She couldn't vote and had little or no governance over her own body. She was all too often defined by the men in her life, even if they meant nothing to her. She constantly struggled to support herself financially. She was mocked, excluded, ignored. She was laughed at, told what to wear, what to think, how to move through the world. Her appearance was always commented upon. If she was beautiful, her morals, her intellectual depth, her innate skills, all were questioned. If, according to the conventions of the day, she was considered plain, she was pitied and patronized. If she didn't conform, she was assumed to be mad. If she didn't have children, she was frustrated, frigid, grief-stricken, cold. 
If she did bear children, more often than not, she disappeared for a while or forever. It was a rare husband who understood her need to paint. If she juggled art and motherhood, she was superhuman. Time and again, she had to work early in the morning or late in the evening, as during the day, she had to run a household or earn money. She worked so hard, it's a wonder she didn't fall asleep on her feet. She scrutinized herself over and over again. From the moment she was born, she was told who to be. She paints a self-portrait because, as a subject, she is always available. This is putting it mildly. She's been barred from so many other places, so many other bodies. Sometimes she's unclear about why and who she's painting her picture for. But does anyone really know what a painting is for? All she knows is that something compels her to look at herself for hours on end, for reasons that have nothing to do with vanity. Quite the opposite. What draws her back to her reflection again and again is the raw self-scrutiny that stems from unknowing, from the confusion she's experienced between the reality of living in her body and the lies that she's been told about it that have been drummed into her since the moment she arrived on Earth. She looks at herself in order to study what she's made of, to understand herself anew, and from time to time to rage against the very thing that confines and defines her. She paints herself to develop her skills, to converse with her contemporaries and with art history. In the act of painting, she makes clear that she is someone worth looking at, someone worth acknowledging. Her paintings assume shapes that she does not always predict. Against all odds, she discovers what she is capable of. Then I move a little bit further along um, because I want to talk about some of the artists that I mentioned. This is just a short introduction to some of the exclusions of art history. And then things cheer up a bit. Um, cabinet of Curiosities. Over the past 500 years or so, there are seemingly countless stories of women struggling to be accepted as serious artists in the face of mass exclusion. When, in 1747, the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna acquired the earliest known self-portrait from 1554 by the great Italian Renaissance artist Sofonisba Anguissola, it was considered so astonishing that a woman should be an artist that her painting was hung not in the art galleries, but in the Schatzkammer or Kunstkammer, the cabinet of curiosities. And this despite the fact that alongside her role as a lady-in-waiting, she had worked as a painter in the court of Philip II of Spain. According to the Team Becker, an uh, art historical um, set of books, in the 16th century alone, there were 30 female artists practicing in Italy. And in the 15th century, we know of 90 women working as professional artists in the Renaissance. Tragically, much, if not most, of their work is now lost. An extreme example of a woman disappearing from the history books is that of the Venetian writer and artist Irene di Spilimbergo, whose gifts when she died in 1559 at the age of only 19 were such that she was praised not only by Vasari, the, uh, the Italian art historian, but by no fewer than 140 poets in around 300 Italian and Latin poems, but none of her work has survived. Or if it has, it must be hanging in a gallery or a home, assumed to be by someone else, most likely a male artist. Likewise, no works by Irene's contemporary, Lucrezia Quistelli, who lived from 1541 to 94, have survived with watertight attributions. In Holland, the paintings of Judith Leister, one of the most prolific portrait artists in the 17th century Holland, were soon after her death until the late 19th century, mostly attributed to her rival Franz Hals. Also in Holland, where the guilds kept organized records of their members, Sarah van Balbagen is listed in 1631 as an oil painter, but no works survive, or at least none are attributed to her. In recent years, New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art discovered that a portrait of a young woman drawing, which had long assumed to be by the 18th century painter Jacques-Louis David, was in fact by Marie Stenis Villiers, who was um, David's contemporary. The list goes on. History is a story told in words. If women aren't mentioned in books, they may as well have never existed. Although there is far more awareness today of history's blind spots, the erasure persists. Only 27 women out of 318 artists are included in the reissue of H.W. Janssen's textbook, 
History of Art, a book which has sold more than 4 million copies in 15 languages, which is up from zero when it was first published in the 1960s. However, Jansen himself, who died in 1982, was fully aware that art history is a story ripe for rewriting. In his introduction to the 1962 edition, the one that included no women artists at all, he wrote, there are no plain facts in the history of art, or in the history of anything else for that matter, only degrees of plausibility. Every statement, for that, every statement, no matter how fully documented, is subject to doubt and remains a fact, only so long as nobody questions it. To doubt what has been taken for granted and to find a more plausible interpretation of the evidence is every scholar's task. The history of art is too vast a field for anyone to encompass all of it with equal competence. Despite Jansen's admission of fallibility, it rarely seemed to occur to the art historians of the past that their views might reflect the conventions of their gender, race, class, country, and sexuality, or that there might be ways of creatingly responding to the world that didn't fit into their narrow remit. By women, for example, who hadn't been taught at an academy, or who had worked in isolation, or for their own pleasure, or who were mothers who made art while their children were sleeping, or who were uninterested in modernity. The way art is made is not neat, because the human mind isn't neat. It's limitless in its variations. Art can reflect religious, spiritual, and political beliefs, private mythologies, secret obsessions, a fascination with a body or the bodies of others, sexuality, gender, the past or the future. It can be a site of reverie or rebellion, a form of propaganda or an idiosyncratic way of responding to the world. Its openness to what it can be is one of its, if not its greatest, sources of power. Art can be a response to anything and made anywhere by anyone. It can give permission to the silenced to speak or create a lexicon for the illiterate. It can lend the world shape and make it graspable to those who feel it is out of reach. So I'll stop there and then start. I'll show you some pictures. Um, so the images that I'm sh going to show you now are just some of the um, artworks that I discuss in my book. And as mentioned, I start with Katerina van Hemmersen. And I was amazed to discover this picture when I came across it. It's really small. It's only about that big. It's quite clumsy. You might not notice it if you were walking through a museum or a gallery. But when you look at it, its radicalism is absolutely remarkable. To think that this young woman, who was only 20, painted this painting at a time when, as far as we know, there were literally no self-portraits by women made that we know of. She was the daughter of an artist um, in Antwerp, and this is why she would have probably had access to art materials, because at this time women were pretty much barred from academies, from life rooms, from art schools. Um, as mentioned, they had no political agency. Um, but one of the remarkable things about this image too is that at the time, mirrors were extremely rare and extremely valuable. Mirrors only came into mass production in the um, late 18th, 19th centuries. And so the, often the only people who had mirrors were aristocrats, royalty, or artists who used them for self-scrutiny or to examine things outside of the naked eye. So it's more than likely Katerina had access to a mirror because of her father's studio. And as I've mentioned in my book, um, a, lot of art, a lot of paintings by women disappeared because they were misattributed to either male artists or they were destroyed because they weren't considered valuable. And we don't know anything about Katerina, very little about her life. We know that she went off to Spain at one point, um, got married, and after she got married, pretty much she disappeared um, from the, our history books anyway. But I have a feeling that this is a very radical gesture by this modest young woman. Because she's at, while she's stressing that she's a woman of virtue, which is what women had to do for hundreds of years, otherwise they were considered um, fallen women and they might have been ostracized by society. So she's painting in her velvet, which an artist wouldn't normally do. And she's also painting a picture of the Virgin, which is to stress her re religiosity. But up in the top, 
And this is at a time where a lot of women don't know how to read and write in the early 16th or the mid 16th century. She's written, I, Katerina van Hemmersen, age 20, painted this. And this modest little remark is so radical to think about 600 years later, because she is saying, I'm a woman, I can work, and I am an artist, which at the time was nothing short of miraculous. Um, this is one of the earliest images um, in existence of a woman painting herself. We don't know who did this illuminated manuscript. It's from circa 1403. Um, and what I love about this little um, painting is that, in a sense, it's a triple portrait. We see the woman painting herself and also looking in a mirror. So we see her three times. We don't know if this was painted by a woman or if it was painted by a man who knew of this artist, but it's a wonderfully intriguing um, little um, painting from across the centuries. Um, as mentioned before, Sofonisba Anguissola, um, whose painting was bought by the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna and was put in the cabinet of curiosities because she was considered to be such a marvel. She wasn't even considered human because she was able to paint and be a young woman. Um, this is quite a demure self-portrait. Um, she was the daughter of a nobleman in Cremona who was quite unusual in that he encouraged his five daughters to paint. And it's probably because they're incredibly um, talented and he could make money from their paintings. So he was quite canny. He could be considered one of the earliest sort of dealers in women, women artists, actually. Anyway, um, Solfanispa Anguissola was the most prolific self-portraitist between Dürer and Rembrandt. And she became famous across Europe in the Renaissance. Yet when I went to art school, no one ever mentioned her. I don't know why. Um, she had a really remarkable life. She didn't marry until she was 40, and that was pretty much an arranged marriage by King Philip II of Spain, where she'd been working as a court painter. Uh, she studied with Michelangelo. Um, she, she married because it was considered scandalous that she was a woman of 40 who hadn't married, but her husband, who was pr apparently quite an easygoing nobleman, was murdered by Albanian pirates off the coast of Sicily. And um, Sofonisba decided to travel back to Italy by herself and fell in love with a sea captain who was half her age. And she ran off with him and had a very happy marriage with him and became such a famous artist that um, people would travel across Europe to visit her. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings of her. This um, is, isn't a self-portrait. This is a portrait of three of her sisters, two of whom became artists and their governess. And this is considered to be one of the first paintings of a domestic scene. So it's not painted for religious reasons, it's not painted for propaganda, it's not painted to praise a king or a queen, it's painted because Sofonisba Anguissola loved her sisters. And what is really remarkable about this painting is that chess at the time was considered an intellectual game. It was mainly considered a male game because it was strategic and it was like um, a proto-battle in a way. So she depicts her sisters playing chess, A, not particularly feminine, according to the rules of the 16th century. And also, remarkably, she depicts her little sister laughing, which is incredibly rare in Renaissance painting because laughter wasn't considered demure for a young woman. Um, very beautiful painting. Um, then we move through to the Baroque period, and you might have heard of Artemisia Gentileschi, one of the great Baroque painters of the um, 17th century. Um, she became uh, notorious at the time because she was raped by her painting tutor and um, because she was considered her father's property and his property was considered to be defiled, the case went to court and she was tortured. The case went on for a year. Um, at the time, Artemisia couldn't, couldn't um, read or write, um, but the painter, whose name I won't mention, who raped her, he um, was condemned and he was sent to exile, but because he was friends with the Pope, he stayed in Rome. Um, Artemisia quickly moved to Florence, was married, and she painted some of the most violent and brilliant and retributional paintings of the Baroque period. Um, and she often painted herself as a saint who had overcome great hardship. And she, here she is as saint, uh, self portrait as St. Catherine of Alexandria. And this is in the National Gallery in London, and it was only recently bought. Um, Mary Beale was the first um, professional women artist in um, Britain. Um, again, she was pretty much self-taught and she had a remarkable husband actually who helped run her studio. And she's also well known because she 
um, was the first person to write a manual for painting in the United Kingdom. She wrote a beautiful little 200 word piece on how to paint peaches. And it's the first known instruction of art in England. So Mary Beale, and she became a very prolific portraitist. And this is um, a self portrait of a lady. Um, then we move on to one of the great characters of um, uh, 18th century France, Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. She was Marie Antoinette's favorite painter. She painted 30 portraits of Marie Antoinette and the royal family. She was exactly the same age as Marie Antoinette. She was born working class in Paris. Um, her, her mother was a hairdresser and her father was um, a dissolute and drunk um, painter who didn't do very well. And she was painting professionally by the age of 15, which is remarkable. I mean, she was totally self-taught. Um, and in this wonderful self-portrait, which actually is also in the National Gallery in London, um, she is riffing on a painting by Rubens that she really admired. But she's sort of bettering this portrait of a woman that Rubens did by por portraying herself not only as an elegant um, woman of society, but also as an artist, holding her magnificent palette. Um, when the revolution came, and I'd just like to stress that the women in my book come from all parts of the political spectrum. Some are conservative, like um, Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. Um, some were radical, some were moderate, some weren't interested in politics, some were firebrands. Um, but she was an extraordinarily spirited woman. And when the revolution came, she basically had to flee the guillotine. So she ran to, um, do I have a picture of it? No, she ran to, um, uh, she went to Venice, where she rather brilliantly painted a very charming self-portrait herself painting a portrait of Marie Antoinette, which would seem to be a rather strange thing to do at this point because it was the French Revolution. But the reason was the head of the Uffizi Gallery was Marie Antoinette's brother. So the painting was acquired for the collection. So she was always a very canny businesswoman. She toured Europe for 12 years, painting enormous amounts of um, uh, portraits of nobility, of the aristocracy, and the occasional self-portrait. And um, I first saw her work when I was in Paris and there was a, a massive painting of her at the Grand Palais in 2015. And I was like, who is this painter? And I went in and there was room after room after room after room of these extraordinary paintings. And I thought, why have I never seen this before? Why did I not know of her? Um, this is one of her um, contemporaries, Adelaide Labie Guillard. She was more on the side of the revolution. So she stayed in Paris during the revolution and she survived. And what's wonderful about this is at a time when women are fairly much banned from academies, she shows herself as a teacher with two pupils. Um, so she's again, I see that, I see these paintings as, um, they look to us like very glamorous paintings of women at the easel, but actually they're really radical gestures around gender um, of the time. Um, then I'm leaping forward to um, 1902, this is Gwen John. Um, she was the sister of a very famous painter at the time, probably the most, he was sort of the Damien Hirst of the day, called Augustus John. Uh, but Gwen John now is better known and a much better painter. And she went to Paris, she led a very quiet life, she was very unbohemian. she had a long affair with Rodin, she loved her cats, she painted lots of self-portraits, which are filled with this sort of brilliant and beautiful interior life of her in the rooms. She lived very modestly, she was often very poor, and uh, I think she's a great psychological painter. Um, one of my favorite painters um, in the book, Paolo Modersen Becker, who I'm sure a lot of you know, um, a truly great painter. Um, and what is radical about this picture is that if you didn't know it, you might assume that she was pregnant, and this is a self-portrait of herself pregnant. But this is actually the self-portrait on her sixth wedding anniversary. She'd been living in the artist um, commune of Worpswede in, in Germany, um, but she was feeling very oppressed by her marriage and by domestic expectations. So she left her husband and she ran to Paris. Um, so she refused to be married anymore. This is the only painting she, she signed, actually, Paula Becker, not Modison. She didn't include her husband's name. And I mean, this is a very symbolic painting, but it can be read essentially as a woman who feels she is pregnant with possibility, not with a child. And this is also radical because it's considered the first naked self-portrait by a woman um, that we know of. Um, Toulouse-Lautrec, the reason I'm showing Toulouse-Lautrec is because 
the figure in this picture is the great painter Suzanne Valadon. And she was a very working class um, artist. Many of the artists around who were painting in Paris at the time who became famous, like um, Mary Cassatt or Bertha Morisot, um, they were all very middle class and were supported by their families. Suzanne Valadon was the daughter of an illegitimate washerwoman who grew up in um, Montmartre. Um, she was working from the age of about 12. She was an acrobat, an artist model, and she can be found in many of the most famous paintings of the day. But as she was modeling for Toulouse-Lautrec, for Renoir, um, for many of the painters of the day, she started looking at how they painted and she became a painter of herself. And I consider her to be one of the best um, painters and really radical painters um, of this time. So this is just after Paula Modison Becker paints her self-portrait. Um, this is Suzanne Valadon, who for a moment entered into a bourgeois marriage, but she fled it and, uh, with her son's best friend, um, who was half her age, and they were very happy for a while. And this is her self-portrait with her new young lover in 1909, Adam and Eve. And you can imagine how radical this painting was for the time. Um, and look at Eve. She's not crushed. She's joyful. She's delighting in her body, and she's having fun with her lover. Um, and this is Suzanne Valadon's self-portrait um, family with her, the family portrait. She was by now supporting her mother. Her son is in front of her, Maurice Utrillo, um, who also became a very famous painter. In fact, when um, uh, Suzanne died, she wasn't given obituaries in newspapers, whereas Maurice Utrillo was given you know, massive obituaries. And she was by far the greater painter. And that's her boyfriend on the left. Um, Sorry, I'm whipping through centuries and, and different movements here. But um, one of the most remarkable um, artists, I think, from the 20s and 30s was Amrita Shergill. Um, she was a young Indian artist um, half, who was half Hungarian. And she moved to Paris to study painting. She was very gifted. And she moved when she was 17. And she became really interested in Gauguin's painting of brown-skinned women, basically in Polynesia and Tahiti. Um, many of these women aren't named, they're objectified, they're used as subjects, um, it's the male gaze. And Amrita Shegil decided to turn this around and paint her self-portrait as a Tahitian, as a sort of riposte to um, Gauguin. And she was a remarkable self-portraitist. I mean, in a way, she was like a, an early Cindy Sherman. She painted herself in so many different roles, in so many different guises, that tragically she died in her late 20s, um, most likely as the result of an abortion that was performed illegally. Uh, Leonora Carrington, a, a great surrealist. Um, this is her self-portrait from 1937, 1938, um, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, Leon many of these women ran away, and Leonora Carrington ran away from her very... Um, a uh, privileged family in England. Uh, she ran away um, via Spain and ended up in Mexico where she lived all of her life. Um, a remarkable writer, short story writer, novelist, um, feminist, and this self-portrait that she made when she was still very young in her early 20s. Um, she always identified with animals. She was a vegetarian. And you can see here, it's a bit like she has the rocking horse which can't move except for up and down behind her head but out of the window is a horse galloping into freedom, while this hyena um, is moving towards her as a, her friend. She, was very, she always identified with wild animals. Um, Lois Melu Jones, if it's hard to be a woman artist in the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, to be um, a black woman in America, a hundred times harder. Um, she was barred from so many things. Um, a absolutely brilliant artist. She went to Paris, and um, when she was in Paris, she, she actually felt that there was a lot less racism when she was studying in Paris than when she was in America. And she painted this self-portrait when she was still quite young as part of her burgeoning knowledge of um, her ancestral African roots. And you can see that um, she's got these African sculptural figures behind her, and she was very interested that a lot of the artists in Paris, like Picasso, were referring to what they called, I think it's a terrible term, primitivism. Um, but she felt that she had a far greater claim to reference these figures in her work than many of the male um, European artists who she was, who were being held up as, um, you know, the great painters of the time. 
Um, then we moved to New Zealand. Um, one of the great um, self-portraitists in New Zealand was Rita Angus. Um, and she was born to, of Scottish heritage in New Zealand, but she was also very interested in Maori heritage and her relationship as a European um, family in living within uh, Polynesian culture. And this is her self-portrait where she, in a sense, turns her name into um, a sort of Polynesian approximation. Um, she's referencing um, her Christian beliefs, uh, Polynesian beliefs. There's the Pacific behind her. There are indigenous plants around her. Um, and it's her, uh, and whether the um, halo behind her is a reference to a religious halo or the blazing sun of the Southern Hemisphere is, of course, ambiguous. Um, Frida Kahlo, one of the great self-portraitists of the 20th century, um, with her homage to her Dr. Farrell, who once again had helped save her life after an operation. Um, so she's holding her, her, um, her body, in a sense, in homage to her doctor. Um, and my book finishes with this great self-portrait by the very, very brilliant Alice Neal, the American um, artist, who actually didn't paint many self-portraits at all. She was one of the most wonderfully compassionate artists around, who really only gained any kind of success in her 70s. Um, she painted her neighbors, she painted migrants, she painted sex workers, she painted her friends, she painted art historians, she painted critics, she painted feminists, um, she painted people who lived on the street. And everything she painted was painted with such compassion for the human condition. And when she was 80, she decided to place herself in the chair that she'd placed so many of her subjects in. And so she sits there, and what I love about this is she's a woman who's 80 years old, and she's entirely comfortable in her body, and she's holding her paintbrush like a wand with which she can conjure up other worlds. And that's where I wanted to finish my book, because I didn't really want to come into the 21st century with photography and with the selfie, because I think that's a whole new thing. I wanted to think about the self portrait as, well, when we think of Katharina van Hammersen right at the beginning in 1548, that probably took her months. It didn't take her a split second as she's walking along the street. And what does that mean? So that's one of the things that I really wanted to think about. And that's why I had a cutoff point at 1980. And during the writing of this book, I had a lot of anxiety because the more I researched it and the more I wrote it, the more I realized who I wasn't talking about and what I wasn't talking about. And so I see this just as, in many ways, as a very personal meditation on something that interested me. It's by no way um, encyclopedic. Um, in a way, it's my homage to these um, extraordinary women who moved and excited me. Um, I think we're probably getting a bit late for my next book, but I could, shall I show any images? Yeah, would anyone like, I, I could just read a tiny bit from my next book yeah. and show you these images, because these images are really great. And you didn't expect that. Um, so, <laughs> all right, I'm just going to read a little bit from my new book. And then there are some really amazing images, which I'll whip through without explaining too much, because I don't want to tire you. Um, so, my next book is, it's coming out in February. Um, and it's called The Other Side, A Journey into Women Art and the Spirit World. In 1996, I went to a Greek island to write a novel about a 19th century fairy painter. 25 years later, I returned to write about women artists and the spirit world. In Greece, this is my homage to you, Marina, today. In Greece, the idea of magical women is nothing new. For more than 12 centuries, for more than 12 centuries, the high priestess at the Temple of Apollo, also known as the Oracle of Delphi, counseled mortals, and even today, each mention of Athens invokes the goddess of wisdom and war. Recitations of ancient Greek poetry always begin with an entreaty to the nine female muses, the source of all inspiration. Their mother, Nemesine, is the goddess of memory. Both periods in my life were times of great transition. In 1996, I was a painter working as a waitress who was becoming a writer. Little did I suspect that on my return to London, I would become an editor at a contemporary art magazine as it was something I had never imagined or planned. Two decades later, I left my job at Freeze to write full time. Everything felt hope hopeful and precarious. To make such a leap involves levels of self-confidence I wasn't entirely sure I possessed. But something needed to change. The relentlessness of it all had worn me out, 
the juggling involved in trying to write alongside a full-time job, the endless daily decisions, the keeping abreast of every twist and turn of the contemporary art world, and the constant demand to have an opinion. In the late summer of 2021, I, like everyone else, was rocked by the interminable pandemic, but the enforced solitude made something very clear. I wanted to return to a place of speculation, to open myself up to new ways of inhabiting the world. I wanted to embrace doubt, nurture curiosity, write with no conclusion. The precariousness of it all, financial, emotional, intellectual, scared me. What I longed for was a kind of re-enchantment, and that is something that art is very good at. In the Aegean, transience is normal. Islands appear and disappear in the heat. The edges of things, land, buildings, thoughts, feel tremulous in the dazzling light. I arrived on the island in late August 2021, bone tired with insomnia, the pandemic, the grey London skies. But summer in Greece has a way of lifting even the most doom-laden of spirits. For the first time in a long while, waking up was a joy. Each day was mine to do with as I pleased. In my bolder moments, I felt that the future would take care of itself. I'd wander barefoot onto the sunny terrace, looking out to sea, drinking coffee to the sound of cicadas and the distant boom of the ferries. Occasionally, I'd paint a watercolour, unconcerned as to whether or not it was good. My friends and I drove across the island, exploring ancient sites, empty coves, monasteries. In the Aegean, unlike the Pacific, which is the ocean I grew up with, sea creatures can't kill you. In the midday heat, we swam in water so clear and blue, it was like floating in warm air. The immensity of the natural world dwarfed us all. All that surrounded us was water, and in the distance, cliffs and a few small rocky coves. We might have been alone on Earth. I like to think it was the same view a swimmer might have experienced a thousand years ago. Somehow, it was reassuring to be reminded in the grand scheme of things. In the heat of the afternoon, we retreated to the cool of our rooms to write, where I time travelled to the world of remarkable women for whom being an artist was less a career than a calling. Women who found solace in the spiritual realm because the physical one was too hostile to their seemingly limitless talents. The things that I and many of my friends worry about, how to live a creative life and pay the bills, meant little to these artists, even the ones who struggled financially. They knew that our time on this planet is brief and they responded to it in the main with joy and energy. Long dead, they blazed with life. Drowsing in the heat, I kept thinking about an exhibition that I had visited on a rainy afternoon in July, just as lockdown momentarily lifted in London. Titled Strange Things Among Us, it was staged at the College of Psychic Studies, founded in 1884 in London and housed in a grand Victorian townhouse. Four floors of rooms were filled with spirit photography, psychic drawings and paintings, Ouija boards, planchettes and more. Faces emerged from the ether. Flowers bloomed from chalky ground. Minds clicked like cameras. The exhibition was enthralling, not least in the way it cast light on, an, on a famously censorious era, the 19th century. The curator, Vivian Robbins, showed me around. She explained that by focusing on various preternatural energies, auras, souls, visions, spirits, ghosts, she wanted to explore how the strange things among us have the power not to terrify, but to evoke awe and wonder in our lives. In one of the strangest years in recent times, I drank it up. To trust in art is to trust in mystery. The suggestion that no serious artist would attempt to communicate with or about the dead or other realms falls apart with the most perfunctory scrutiny. Across the world, the spirit across the globe, the spirit world has shaped culture for millennia. In the West, the Bible was the source of most pre-modern art, and it's full of magic, the supernatural, and non-human agents. Where would the Renaissance be without its saints, angels, and devils, its visions of humans manipulated by powers beyond their comprehension? Or ancient Greece without its gods and goddesses who shape-shifted at the drop of a hat? Or, for that matter, most pre-modern art? But then art itself is a form of alchemy, the transformation of one thing, an idea, or a material, into another. It is in its nature to be elusive rather than literal, to deal in association, symbol, and encryption, to honor intuition and imagination over reason. 
All of this chimes with, with much magical practice. It's as unconcerned as a prophet with accuracy. Physicists tell us that our reading of time is crude, but artists have always known this. They constantly mind the past, even as they're imagining possible futures. How can change, be it new machines or new ideas, be visualized if it can't first be imagined? And who would ever assume that imaginations run along straight lines? Most artists are in some shape or form, time travelers and ghost whisperers. They have myriad ways of accessing the dead, by the tangible proof of their thinking, books or paintings say, or through more esoteric means, mediumship, intuition, ritual, dreams, call it what you will. Although numerous 19th and early 20th century artists created their pictures via spirit communication, um, the more I discovered about them, the less I took an interest in the veracity of their claims. The creative act is often mystifying. To pin it down and dissect it is possibly the least interesting and possibly most futile thing you can do with it. I wanted to dig in to what these artists created. I didn't want to judge their works. Um, I think I might stop there. Um, so here are some of the artists that I talk about in my book. Um, this is one of the most radical artists I came across. Um, if we look at this photograph of this woman, she looks like a very respectable 1860s Victorian lady. Um, she's quite wealthy. She has a cameo around her neck. But if you look closely at it, there's one strange detail. She has a dagger in her hair. Now, Georgiana Houghton became a spiritualist via one of her neighbors. She went to um, a seance and she felt that things were revealed to her in the seance that no one could possibly know but her. Um, she started making pictures um, via spirit mediums who communicated to her. And this is the kind of painting that she made in the 1860s. I mean, basically, she's like a sort of spiritual Jackson Pollock. Um, she also amazingly wrote an autobiography, which you can get on Kindle for about two pounds. And in it, she explains her work processes and her belief systems, and she's very practical. Um, this is another one of hers, the portrait of the Lord Jesus. So this is 1862. And really remarkably, because she felt that she wanted to get the word out about these pictures, she hired a gallery in Bond Street, um, and she showed a huge, a huge cross-section of her work. And she sat in there for three months, and people came in. And, we all know what Victorian art looks like. It's very narrative, it's very academic, it's very descriptive. And the, this show was actually reviewed in all of the major newspapers. Some journalists thought she was crazy, others were fascinated by it. It was at a time when you know, most people considered themselves to be religious, so the possibility that you might be able to speak with the spirit world actually wasn't considered as wild as it might have been. Um, Anyway, she's, I find her an absolutely fascinating artist, so I talk about her life and work. This is another one of hers. Um, and what's interesting is that a lot of these women are express, expressing beliefs about religion, and they're very religious, but they express it in abstract images. And um, one of the um, arguments in my book, which you know, many people have made before, is that you know, when I was at art school, I was taught that the first abstract painting was made by Kandinsky in, in 1911. Composition 5. Um, I love Kandinsky, great artist, great writer, but to say that he invented abstraction, I mean, apart from the many women who were making abstract pictures in the 19th century, indigenous cultures around the world have been exploring what we might call abstraction, but which are very codified maps and representations of belief systems for 60,000 years in Australia, for example. Um, then we move on to Hilma F. Clint, who I'm sure a lot of you have known about, because when I saw her exhibition at the um, Moderna Musique in Stockholm in 2013, it blew my mind. Um, this is her at art school in 1885. And again, she wasn't included in the um, Inventing Abstraction exhibition at MoMA in, tw yeah, in 2015, because the um, curator didn't believe that um, Hilma was an artist. They believed she was a spiritualist, when many of the beliefs that she had were exactly the same ones that Kandinsky, Mondrian, Clint, um, many of the male artists, um, slightly later, were dealing with in the same time. Um, and this is a picture of her work at the Guggenheim Museum. And these works, um, Hilma F. Clint made, um, 
between 2000, oh, not 2000, um, 1906 and 1915. Um, so these were made before, a, a good few years before Kandinsky was making his abstract pictures. Um, she didn't show them to the public. They were only shown to her um, spiritual circle, which obviously um, uh, Kandinsky was showing his work in um, galleries. Um, and the reasons why she didn't show her work, that's a long discussion, which I probably don't have time for here. Um, this is her altarpiece number one. And one of the things I think was really wonderful about her work being shown at the Guggenheim, and by the way, that her show at the Guggenheim um, was the most attended in the Guggenheim's history in New York. Um, more than 600,000 visitors to that exhibition, which is extraordinary. And during her lifetime, Hilmar Klint had actually designed a temple to show her paintings in that she never, that was never realized. Um, and her belief system was very dictated to by theosophy um, and anthroposophy. Um, and really interestingly, they never met, but Baroness Hille Ribe, she was a German um, aristocrat who was an artist, and she went to New York, and she became the chief advisor to Solomon R. Guggenheim about the design of, uh, the shape and design of the Guggenheim collection. And Hill, Hilla Ribe was a theosophist, and she, her ideas around um, how art should be displayed were amazingly similar to what Hilma had written in her notebooks, even though they never met. And so it was Hilla Ribe who found the architect Frank Lloyd Wright um, who, who had a great sort of belief in the spirit world and in the importance of nature. And he, of course, ended up designing the Guggenheim. So you could say that the Guggenheim is a somewhat, it's something of a temple to theosophy. And um, so it was really appropriate that Hilma F. Klint ended up having her major retrospective there. Um, these are just a few of the other artists I talk about. Mary Whitman, the dancer and choreographer. Um, Agnes Pelton, the transcendental um, uh, the desert transcendentalist who was making pictures in the deserts of California in the 1920s and 30s and a bit later. Um, I love Ethel Colquhoun. She was a British surrealist, but she was actually kicked out of the British surrealist movement because they didn't want her to have her occult beliefs. Um, this is her photograph by Man Ray in Paris in 1932. And he said, Man Ray said to Ethel that she could um, ha include whatever she wanted in the portrait. So she wanted to depict herself as the um, goddess Demeter. And so apparently she searched Paris to find a sheaf of wheat in Paris in 1932 and walked across Paris to Man Ray's studio holding her sheaf of wheat. Um, so this is Man Ray's portrait of Eiffel Cocoon as a very ancient goddess and also a very modern goddess because she's in a very fashionable dress. She's showing her leg there. She's got fashionable makeup. So it's a great picture of both modernity and myth, I think, this. She was a writer, a painter, a poet, um, a magician. Uh, she did tarot, um, fascinating. The Tate now has her entire archive of more than 5,000 objects. Um, and this is how I became interested in Eiffel Cahoon. This is her extraordinary painting, Scylla, in 1938. Scylla um, was a minor goddess who was turned by the witch Serki um, into a monster who ate sailors um, in the Aegean. And you can read about um, Scylla in Homer, for example. Um, but uh, Eiffel Cahoon has taken uh, the myth of Scylla, so we see these giant rocks and the boat approaching, um, into, she's fused it with a self-portrait of herself in the bath. Um, so these are her legs touching at the top. You can see her pubic hair has been transformed into seaweed um, and the water around her is in the bath. So it's a beautiful double self-portrait here. Um, Emma Kuntz, the Swiss healer and artist who, who used her, her um, pictures for therapeutic means. And there, was a, there have been many exhibitions devoted to Emma Kuntz in recent years, a really fascinating artist. These are some of her works. Um, this was the pendulum that she used to make her work. Um, and you can still go to the grotto in Switzerland um, where she worked and where she discovered the healing powers of um, Ion A, which was um, a, a chemical compound. Um, this is Lenore Tawney, um, who was a very wonderful um, American um, artist who worked in textiles and fiber. 
um, and who had, um, she was very much interested um, in Buddhism and had a guru. Uh, she's a really fascinating woman. I think this is a beautiful portrait of her in 1959. Um, very important to me and I think the world to acknowledge the extraordinary achievements of um, Australian Aboriginal artists um, for whom uh, women are central and always have been to community expression. Um, and this is um, an extraordinarily beautiful painting that I saw in the flesh. It's probably the size of these two wall hangings put together, and it's made by a group of women. You can see their names here. And essentially, it's a mapping of the land. So every stroke of paint in this um, work has significance to these women, both about the land that is their ancestral lands and is also significant to their um, spiritual beliefs and their dreamings. Um, so this is an enormously complex painting um, and staggeringly beautiful. Um, and then I'm just finishing on a drawing, an amazingly detailed drawing by one of my best friends, Donna Huddleston, who's always been a big inspiration to me. And this was from an exhibition she had in London recently. And um, Donna and I talk many hours into the night about many of these subjects. <laughs> um, so this is um, a portrait of an imaginary woman by Donna um, with birds and the sky. So I'll finish there. Thank you. <laughs>
um, putting in focus on, on these women that actually had an own career but weren't able to, to, to step ahead? Um, some, I mean, my, my research isn't encyclopedic. And so, for example, I don't talk about photography in the sense of Dora Maar, who, of course, was an amazing um, artist. You know, I tried to shine a light on the ones that I could, but I can't cover everyone. And, you know, that's, I think, really heartening, too, because there is so much more research still to be done. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, during your research, did you maybe recognize how women... Ex Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, doing your research, you. did you um, kind of recognize how these female artists exchange? Did they exchange more about mm. their topics and techniques mm. with each other? Yeah, that, that's such an important question, I think. Um, you know, with, with my book on self-portraits, because a lot of them were very pre-modern, it was very difficult to find out much about them. For example, with Artemisia Gentileschi, um, she, she learned how to read and write after her trial, and so we know a lot about, oh, not a lot, we know a lot more about her because through her letters. But she tended to be quite, um, uh, she was close to her only child who survived, who was a daughter, who was a painter, who actually we don't know what became of the daughter or her paintings. But um, she didn't tend to hang out with so many women, although she was friends with Barbara Strozzi, the great Venetian composer. And um, so it was during writing about Artemisia Gentileschi that I discovered the, the beautiful compositions of Barbara Strozzi. So that, that was interesting. But I couldn't find out much about her or anything about her, about her being friends with other female um, artists. Um, when we get to the 19th century, one of the really fascinating things about um, the spiritualist groups I started researching was their sense of community. And these were women-led groups, like Hilma's group was um, the group of five, which was five women. And then actually, various times, it became bigger and smaller. Um, and that many of these spiritualist groups were women-led. And I get the sense that um, the fact that they were excluding men from these groups gave them a certain power within these groups, because it meant that they weren't working through patriarchal structures. And so they were creating their own way of creating work. And that's why often this work is outside sort of patriarchal notions of what constitutes value. Um, so I think these spiritualist groups run by women were probably sidelined out of art history because it was a male art history who was dismissing their power and because these women weren't towing the line in terms of what was, what was expected of a woman at the time. So especially in the 19th century, huge amounts of um, women-led groups and support groups. Um, in the French Revolution, um, you know, I showed the picture of um, Adelaide Labie Guillard with her two students. And uh, you know, there was lots of rumors that she and Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, who were the two main women painters just pre-revolution, um, that they were rivals and that they were constantly fighting, but apparently that's been a bit debunked now, and it was something that was sort of whipped up for gossip rather than... Um, so that they were colleagues, I don't know that they were friends. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then other... Gwen John, I know she was... Um, she went to the Slade School of Art, and she, there was a lot of women enrolled at the Slade, actually. It was one of the few art schools that accepted women in the early 20th century in London, and they were big group of women who were supporting each other. And pretty much she was the only one who continued to be a professional artist because all the others married and then sort of disappeared into dom domesticity. Um, Paula Modison Becker was um, best friends with C Clara Westhoff, um, who became a sculptor, quite a renowned sculptor who worked with Rodin. And Clara Westhoff, um, you probably know, married Raina Maria Rilke. And um, when Paula Modison Becker died, Rilke wrote the most extraordinary um, howl of a poem at her death. Um, he was devastated, as was Clara, and Clara was Paula's best friend. And some of them, Paula's letters and her journal, absolutely wonderful reading, I can't recommend it enough. And the stories of like Paula and Clara exploring art and life, and they're so full of life and joy. You know, Clara, Paula obviously died very young, um, 33 when she died, um, but yeah, she lived life to the most, and her relationship with Clara was an extremely important one. Yeah, They're, I mean, it's a case-by-case -case basis, really. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for it. You're welcome. Uh, I feel like the mo like the museums that they work more with modern uh, art, they're they're changing and they're like uh, like restructuring. I think like because of the COVID, they kind of they many of them they did like some restructure that because many of them they were closed. And I'm sorry. And where where is this? Like in, during the COVID, for example, yeah. I'm thinking in two museums. They kind of uh, did some restructure, and then they were putting a lot of women in, you know, in the exhibitions. Mm. But the the more like um, old uh, art, they are mm. like not um, changing so much. How do you feel? Like, what is the relationship with like woman artists in the museums? Uh, um, in terms of historic museums? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting actually at the beginning of when was it? Beginning of 2020. I traveled to Madrid at the Prado. Oh, yeah, the Prado, because um, it was the second exhibition that they'd put on in their 200 year history of women. And it was Sofonis for Anguissola and Lavinia Fontana. And, you know, it was a great exhibition. It was really interesting. And they actually included the Katerina van Hemmersen painting. And, you know, I think so, you know, the National Gallery toured the Artemisia Gentileschi painting. I mean, obviously, these especially big historic collections were collected over the last few hundred years with patriarchal structures. So, you know, I don't think we should be surprised that they have a vast majority of, of male artists. But many of them now have sort of affirmative action in terms of looking at the art history of the past and acknowledging that art history is a work in progress and they're trying to redress that through acquisitions and through education, um, which is great. And many of them are doing, you know, good work, but, you know, it's a long way to go because, I mean, I don't think there will ever be an absolute parity in historic museums because... You know, I think like in the National Gallery in London, it's, they've got two and a half thousand works and 15 by women or something, 20 maybe, you know. So, I mean, they're vast differences, but, but there is an acknowledgement now that there are other, there are revisionist art histories, yeah. And, you know, I mean, the thing is about this, it's not as if, you know, I'm theorizing. It's, it's a fact that women have always made art, they were always there and they were excluded from the story. It's quite simple. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so museums are trying to fix that to a point. <laughs> if you're not very tired, we have one more question. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. sure. Sorry, my back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, also, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, pragmatic question is... Yeah. Uh, where can I buy a book? Can I buy it? Oh, in, great yeah. question. <laughs> um, uh, well, so uh, you can... Uh, I, online, here. I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what bookshops are it's here. Possible but, yeah. here when you're here. It, it's not translated into German, annoyingly, but no. it is translated into Dutch, and it's available in the UK, <laughs> Australia, uh, yeah, New Zealand, America. Yeah. I want to yeah. have it. Yeah. And then um, you can get it on Kindle too, if you want to get it on Kindle. I mean, no, the, yeah. I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And my question is. Um, also, when, when you have this experience mm. in your back and in, in your research years, yeah. how's your experience also with, um, for example, other people who, who I was thinking about uh, further? After the image, there is also like the museum, and there's the, there's the art world with the art market. Yeah. The, the, and I was thinking also about the iconography. Mm -hmm. How is your experience with? Or can you tell something about people who have aims, who do work in progress about something I was thinking about, like rewriting yeah. the existing iconography mm. um, of, let's say, art history as it is so far? Because yeah. when I see all, all these images, I think none of the images were telling about vanity, mm. for example. and. Mm. Um, but it seems such a big impact in, in every museum for power structures, for holding up mm. the current form of orders, mm. and this all belongs to, yeah, to the image. And then I was thinking, is there uh, a work going on so far for an attempt for rewriting this? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are, I mean, a lot of the sort of major work around feminist art history began in the 50s with um, art historians like, you know, Griselda, oh, I mean, very slightly later, Linda Nochlin, Griselda Pollack, Jermaine Grier, you know, a lot of these, Rosika Parker. Um, and now it's becoming more and more, it's a bit like a snowball, 
you know, it's getting that bigger. And museums can't ignore this anymore. And so, you know, for example, when the National Gallery in London bought the Artemisia Gentileschi painting, they toured it around the UK. It was really amazing. Um, and they, it didn't just go to museums. It went to prisons. It went to schools. It went to church halls. And it went to all these different towns and villages where people would come together to discuss it. And the art historians would come and discuss the importance of Artemisia Gentileschi to Baroque um, iconography. You know, so, um, you know, there is, I mean, it depends on the institutions. Some are more entrenched and old school than others. And some are really open to, you know, exploring, um, exploring these themes. Yeah. Like the, the National Gallery put on a big Artemisia Gentileschi exhibition, which was fantastic. And it was the first time they had a monographic show devoted to a woman, yeah, in, in the history of it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, Thank you. yeah. Welcome. Jennifer, we're going to yeah. take one last question okay, from sure. Flaka. Sure. Since, <laughs> since. I was wondering about how actually the context contextualizing them in relation to when it happened, what happened, mm. what time, mm. it helps a lot to validate yeah. the, the, the meaning of it, what mm. we are looking at, you know? Mm. So this moment of historicizing it. Yeah. So the other, uh, so it's more like a kind of a comment and how much work needs to be done on that because mm. it's not just like putting them on the wall but really creating a relation mm. and putting dots together. Yeah. And um, the other, uh, more like a question would be, what do you think about Venice Biennial? How about do what? Venice Biennial? Oh, the Venice Biennial. Yes. Yeah, which was considered the first biggest show yeah. with woman artists, many yeah. we never saw or something, but also new ones. Yeah. How would you see this in relation to the, to the art system? Yeah. Um, I, first, to your first point, I totally agree, you know, that every Every image that I've shown here has to be seen not just in a purely art historical context, but it has to be seen in a cultural and a social and political context, you know, to see how these works were produced and what was their function and what, what were the permissions granted or denied at the time. So I totally agree with you that this is a social history as well as an art history. Um, uh, the Venice Bien, I, uh, I mean, I have to say I wrote one of the essays for the catalogue, so you know I have a vested interest in it in a sense that um, I found it really absolutely fascinating, and um, I thought Cecilia did an amazing job of you know coming at this conversation from. I thought what was really interesting is that she actually didn't foreground gender or sexuality or sex within the way she framed the exhibition. She said this is a bunch of really interesting artists who I want to place together. And so in a way, it was almost like a, a post-feminist exhibition in that she was saying, these are interesting artists. Oh yes, many of them happen to be women or, or non-binary, you know, but um, what I'm interested in is what these artists produced, and this is why. And, you know, I thought that the conversations that she set up between contemporary art, between work of the 1920s, for example, I thought the stuff from the 20s was really strong. Um, you know, I mean, it's like all Venice Biennale, it's, it's a huge conversation and you can't hear every strand of it. And you get, you know, by the end of it, you, you think, my God, how can I possibly absorb all of this? But I thought it was really lively, it had a great energy, and I thought there were many artists who hadn't been shown before, you know, in that kind of context. And so, in that sense, I found it an important show. Yeah. Thank you so much for yeah. this and this bringing in my mind because, of course, the press uh, was uh, a lot on pointing out mm. about the female mm. artist, the first bigger so, which yeah. was not necessarily what Cecilia's from line. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting, as I was telling you just before mm. we went in, that you choose, we speak of exclusion, but you choose to focus on self-portraiture. Mm. Mm. And in the second book on spirits mm. and women, which are two sort of it could have been two weaknesses, let's mm. say, and women are taking agency of those. Mm. Women mm. that they are locked mm. in their homes, so mm. they see themselves, mm. but somehow you tell the story mm. through, through their self portraiture, yeah. if you agree with yeah. what you were telling me. And also, women considered witches, witchcraft, mm. and then they're taking agency mm. of that and they create yeah. something extremely important. Yeah. And you also choose to focus on that. Yeah two moments. Yeah. It's deliberate, I yeah, guess. Yes, absolutely, yeah. 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 I mean, that's why self-portraiture for women was so, 
was so prevalent because they were excluded from so many other subjects. You know, but if they had themselves, they could turn you know, their gaze to themselves because, I mean, they, were, they had access to still life. That's why so many women excelled in still life as well. But um, I think what I find fascinating about these self-portraits, it's like looking at someone's self-examination across the centuries, and you can never reach a fully, you know, you can't reach a neat conclusion about this because we will never know what these women are thinking. So all we can go is on their visual language that they've left behind, and we can try and decode it and come to conclusions. But, you know, this is what art is. I mean, this is what we've been talking about in our writing class. You know, art isn't a precise science. It's something that is around, it's constantly speculative. Yeah. Thank you so much. Before we leave, we have two announcements. Sorry, <laughs> no, we're going please. to Pentanding. Yeah. And so, in this, um, wait a minute, let me find it. Is it, Sophie, this Saturday, right? There will be open studios in the queries, the marble queries, and that is from 12 to 4. And so you're very welcome there, where Cecilia Brown, the teacher, and the students will so and speak about the work. As well as part of this um, uh, public program, there is a workshop by Anna Novak from Camp School, and that will be on Saturday, 27th of August. And then you have to subscribe for this if you're here so you can book your space. And of course, in between the two, we will have on Monday, Bonaventure Sobenjen Ninguk uh, speaking to us at 7 here always. And on uh, Tuesday, 23rd of August, uh, Slavs and Tatars uh, speaking to us here as well. But we leave all this aside and give a warm applause to Jennifer for her graduation.